There are some who say, well, the whole feminism work was just to divide marriages, to create a wedge between men and women. And your argument seems to be different from that, though. Yeah, no, that's right. There's these two competing strains of early feminists. One is this strain as pursuit of individuality. This other strain, this Wollstonecraftian strain, understands liberty and rights and equality entirely differently. It views men and women as deeply interdependent. And that's a strain that was lost, but one that I think really has the capacity to be kind of reclaimed. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. I hope everybody had a great week and is just doing having a great day wherever you are. Today on the podcast, we're going to be exploring more women's rights, feminism, and really that dynamic between men and women in politics and culture, because we've talked about this on the podcast recently a few different times, had some really fascinating conversations. Recently, we talked with Carrie Grass about her book, The End of Woman, and her sort of view of feminism as being about a cult, the free love, and radical competition and individualization from men. We're going to have on today the Scott Legal Scholar and Catholic mom of seven. She's also an amazing writer, a prolific researcher of women's rights and feminism, to talk about her view of the history of the women's rights movement. Because the reality is many Christians today, you know, and non-Christians today, we agree that, well, things are chaotic with abortion and with obviously the sexual revolution and gender ideology that, yes, men and women have shared equal dignity and shared standing before God in terms of their shared dignity, and that they need to collaborate with each other, the family is the most important institution, but that we do share civil and human rights. And I think that is a pretty mainstream view among many, I would say, conservatives, many Christians and non-Christians. And so you don't necessarily have to identify as a feminist to have the view that, yes, of course, women have rights, they have the same rights as that men have, but where did this all go wrong? It went wrong when feminism went wrong and the sexual revolution happened and we started competing with each other and we started to demand sexual uh, license and, you know, killing preborn children, all of this. So the big question that I have today for Erica, and she wrote a book called The Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision, and she talks about how the actually early women's rights folks, let's not even use the name feminist right now, we're very Christian. We're very, you could say, conservative. We're very for family values. They just wanted to ensure that they could protect themselves and their children if there was an abusive marriage happening. They wanted to encourage men to virtue and not just be seen as sort of a plaything or just you know put on a pedestal by society and not have responsibilities in society. They wanted to be able to argue against slavery and argue for virtuous behavior in society and have a role in in working towards that. So things that most people today, you know, even people with a lot of conservative, you could call them values, would completely agree with. So we're going to talk about how did it go wrong? Where did it go right? It's a really fascinating conversation. If you're into history, and especially the history of thought, this is a conversation you're not going to want to miss with Erica Bacciacci. Before we get into it, I want to thank our sponsor, first sponsor, Seven Weeks Coffee. You guys know I love Seven Weeks Coffee. If you haven't tried them yet, what are you waiting for? Seven Weeks Coffee is gourmet organic coffee. It's that if you are a coffee snob, this is the coffee for you. You have to try them. They're delicious. You can find any roast that you like. It is low acid. It's obviously mold free. It's sourced ethically. It's just amazing coffee. It's the best coffee. And it supports the pro-life movement. So every time you order a bag of Seven Weeks Coffee, 10% of your order goes directly to pregnancy resource centers. So what better company to buy from? So go to 7weekscoffee.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's 7weekscoffee.com. Excited to have Erica join on the podcast. Thanks, Lila. It's great to be with you. Awesome. Well, let's start with your background. Tell us a little bit about your professional background. Sure. Um, So I have a master's in theology uh, and a law degree, um, and I've spent the last, I guess, 20 years um, working at sort of the intersection of constitutional law, uh, women's rights, and political theory, um, but certainly from within sort of a Catholic uh, social teaching perspective as a Catholic. Um, I've uh, edited a couple books before my recent book. Um, one is called The Cost of Choice, um, about sort of 
uh, from Encounter Books many decades ago, looking at the impact of abortion on women from a women's perspective. Um, it's a collection with a great deal of wonderful women, uh, Marianne Glendon, Elizabeth Fox Genovese, um, others. And then I wrote, uh, collected a collection of essays um, called Women, Sex, and the Church, A Case for Catholic Teaching, where we sort of look at how pro-woman um, Catholic teaching is, including teachings on abortion, contraception, um, and all that. And then my most recent book is called um, The Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision, and that's out from Notre Dame Press um, two years ago. Awesome. Well, you've done some incredible work, and your last book you just referenced is fantastic. And I think your work, too, has been groundbreaking and re um, providing a new interpretation, I would say, of feminism and how we got here um, in terms of the relationships between men and women with the technological changes that were so dramatic. We discussed this on the podcast with Nancy Piercy recently and really the emergence from the family farm and into the cities and into the industrial world. Tell us a little bit about how you see, let's just start with this very broad space, how you see the last two centuries, not just in terms of political theory and political movements, but really deeply impacting the family and male-female relationships because of technological changes. Yeah, that's a great place to start um, because I think you know, there are many of us now um, who are really coming to see that feminism is really comes out of early feminism, especially comes out of technological shifts um, due to industrialization, liberalism, the rise of capitalism. And so what you saw for most of human history is uh, men and women working together on farms um, in family shops, working with great collaboration, interdependence. Um, Really, there was no time to sort of dispute gender roles, <laughs> anything like that, because subsistence just required um, sort of a, a deep um, uh, sort of embodied existence um, and one that was, you know, really the the kind of um, ebbs and flows around family life um, and the needs of, of children. Um, certainly the work that women did was um, mainly in the home with children, you know, pregnant, at the breast, things like that, underfoot, um, but doing really important productive work in the family home, in the in the homestead. And then with men tend to be outside with their, you know, with their boys um, doing uh, work that required their greater strength, uh, musculature and that and that sort of thing. And so what happens um, with the rise of industrialization and then liberalism? So two sort of separate things. One is you know, technological, and the other is really um, sort of theoretical, right? Um, you have the the rise of of you know machines, sort of taking the labor um, from the home um, and putting it into factories. And so, you know, there's great good that comes out of industrialization, but it also has really important uh, impact on the family and how um, uh, you know how. The, subs the subsistence that was interdependent uh, in the agrarian, um, you know, homestead is shifted for when men leave the homestead to go out and earn wages. And so there's a way in which, you know, obviously through scripture, through understandings of, um, of I mean, from Aristotle onward, there's sort of an understanding that, you know, man is the head of the household, etc. But because of this interdependence, there's not really you know, men are just as dependent upon women as women are upon men. And so there's not really any complaint about that kind of, um, say, you could say legal subordination of women. But as men leave the household and they start to collect wages, the family itself starts to become dependent on those wages. And so women become really, really dependent upon male earning. And um, so there's like a tilt. There's like a new deep asymmetry, economic asymmetry, you could say. So when you lived with a virtuous man, your husband was virtuous and he came home and he was tired from working out in the you know factories and you were there and you're tired from raising your children, then all is well, right? But when men were sort of called by, um, you know, alcohol and um, all the sort of temptations of, of um, the cities, the growing cities, and also the temptations of prostitution and all of that, I think partly because of how hard the labor was. Um, there's a way in which vicious men <laughs> made those kind of sexual asymmetries between men and women far, far worse. And so that's when you start to see the rise of women 
the very first thing women do in the in the 19th century is ask for to kind of to make demands for joint property ownership. They basically say, look, we're doing all this work in the home. <laughs> and so we really ought to, um, just as you know, men and women, married men and women have today, jointly own the home. It shouldn't just be the man's to own, but the woman is kind of his sort of servant um, in understanding of coverture, uh, the common law it, status of, of married women. A quick question about that, because it's yeah. an interesting point where, you know, today, even some, you know, conservatives would say, well, you know, if you're married, I, I don't know that they're directly come ag- come out against property rights for women, but there's this sort of uh, poo-pooing of what the feminists did in order in securing, you know, property rights and securing the right to vote. And there's this sense of it wasn't really, you know, there were more bad outcomes than good. Again, these are not all conservative, but these are some, there's some and some, uh, I would say, um, influential ones, you know, who are very opposed to even early feminism. And were, were th- was that desire to co-own the property, was part of it a protective measure? Because in cases of abuse or addiction, where their spouse is not trustworthy, they didn't want to be left out high and dry if they needed to separate for the protection of themselves or their children and they wanted to be able to still secure some of their own property for their own subsistence. Was that part of that driving that that request or that demand? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, there's a way in which, again, if you're if you have sort of a a friendship um, in your in your marriage and there's a great deal of love and support and you're married to a virtuous man, none of this is really much of an issue at all. Right. The issue comes when Um, you're, you know, you have sort of no marital rights in all sorts of different ways. You have no marital rights to resist um, sexual activity from your husband. And so there's sort of the forcing of sex upon women that, and, you know, obviously there's, um, uh, you know, in that way, they talk about like a forced motherhood, very different from how today's feminists talk about forced motherhood. And so they're asking at that point also for something like voluntary motherhood, by which they mean the right to engage in that act, which might make me a mother. Why? Because they understood themselves, all of those 19th century feminists, and then going all the way back to Wollstonecraft, understood mothers, those who are pregnant, to have duties of care to their children. And so they took those duties very seriously. The other thing is that they wanted custody rights. So if their husband was abusive, if their husband um, was a drunk, was you know using his wages on prostitutes or or you know, all sorts of other kind of infidelities. Um, There was no way for a woman to care for her children. And yet if she tried to divorce him, then he would have custody of the children. So when separation, you know, when she would separate him, she was still considered his wife and so had no capacity to contract for, say, a job to work, even if those wages would be really menial. So, I mean, she's kind of stuck in this hard place. And so women start to recognize, look, like for our own sake, for the sake of our children, for the sake of really men to man up and and be virtuous themselves, we have to hold them to higher standards. And the law wasn't wasn't doing that. So the law. So yeah, sorry. No, no, it's really it's really interesting. I think it's such an important point because I think we take for granted the protections that exist today. That's and right. as women, and you know, and I, I say this with the, all the tremendous caveat of I hate modern feminism. You know, <laughs> um, in terms of what it advocates for, and I do want it. We're going to get to that because. It's incredibly important. You know, there's uh, billions, literally billions of abortions globally over the last few decades. And I do think that not I wouldn't blame just feminist ideology, current feminist ideologies for that. I think a lot of that sexual revolutionaries. But we're going to get to that. But I think it's an important point because, you know, there are excesses. There are abuses. These things are real. They're not they're not some. Uh, fantasy that people come up with as an excuse for divorce. This is a real thing, and they does require at times, um, you know, this is this would be the reason for divorce for sep- for legal separation. Uh, now, in the Catholic tradition, you you may do a legal separation, a divorce, and then you do not remarry if it was a valid marriage, and that's you know a very challenging situation, but it's a real one. But we're not talking about remarriage here. We're talking about separation for the safety of one's children and oneself. And in the case of these early feminists, there was no recourse. Is that right, Erica? There's no recourse for the woman who has the adulterous, uh, abusive husband. If she separates from him, she has she's lost her custody, and then she couldn't. She literally couldn't get a job to support herself. That's right. And any and and I mean, remember, any property she brings into the marriage too at that point is considered his because the idea of marriage at that point 
is both scripturally, but also from this common law doctrine of covetures that the man covers over the wife. And so they become one. Now, of course, that's very lovely. And I consider my husband and I <laughs> one, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is when a woman is like civilly dead, as they say in the language of Seneca Falls, she loses all of her property that she's even brought into the marriage. So when you're a wealthy woman, you know, and your husband and your father has kind of bartered you off to like the highest donor or whoever's the highest bidder or whoever would make that good marriage, then what 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 wealthy fathers did at that point is they always put their property in trust so that if something should go wrong with this marriage, that 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 woman in that marriage was capable of accessing the property. So, of course, these women rights advocates are saying, well, that's not fair that only wealthy dads can do that. What about all these women who come into marriage and, you know, they have some bit of some parcel of land, some some of their own like sort of belongings. And those all go into the hands of the of the husband. Again, great. Fine. If you have a collaborative marriage and you have a virtuous husband. But that's just not the case. I mean, the law it is the case for all women. Right. And so, you know, the law has to protect those women. I mean, the same with, say, voting is that the voting is actually like really far into the, into the um, early women's rights movement. It's not one of the first asks, even though we do see it several times in Seneca Falls. And that's that's what we'll talk about Elizabeth Cady Stan. But she's pushing for that. That's something that wasn't really seen as important at first because of this understanding of vicarious representation. So just as in a Republican form of government, you have representatives representing, you know, the 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 voters in this understanding, you had men, the head of the household, represent the families. But when you see men go off because of industrialization, because of this rise of liberalism, where, you know, the individual male, uh, you know, homeowner is the one who has all the rights, it becomes difficult when, you know, he's not representing the woman or the family. And he's, you know, kind of taking his own self-interest at heart. And that was when voting becomes something more important. Just to fast forward, Voting does not come ab about through actually Stanton and all the people the 1970s feminists hold up as these great suffragists. It actually comes about through conservative women. So it's through Frances Willard, especially, um, who's the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, who is working across the country in states trying to get women to have vote, be able to vote in states. She says the commandments are voted up and down, up or down in every election. And she calls the vote the home protection ballot. Why? Because she sees the problem with intemperance among men, and she wants women to vote, be able to vote for the goods of, of protecting the home and the family and children against sort of the intemperate or kind of drunkenness um, of men. Not all men, obviously, but there are some men who, you know, have to be protected against. Our next sponsor is Carly Jean Los Angeles. I'm so excited about this new sponsor. I've been ordering clothes from them left and right. They have the most comfortable jeans the price point is great, especially if you use my code Lila Rose at checkout for 20% off your order. But the jeans are so flattering, so comfortable. The dresses are so cute and flowy and comfortable. The tops are well made and they just have the best sweaters. It's a it's a wonderful clothesline. This is a company that shares your values. Again, ethically sourced clothes. You're going to love Carly Jean Los Angeles .com clothes. So check out Carly Jean Los Angeles. Buy something for yourself. Buy something for your friend. Buy something for your mom or your daughter. Check out CarlyJeanLosAngeles.com and use the code Lila Rose at checkout for 20% off your order. And the temperance, particularly the role of the temperance movement in sort of the women's suffrage work that was being done, was temperance a particular... I mean, today we have drunkenness in our society. It does exist. You know, I think there's probably more awareness today, I would argue. I mean, from a young age, we're told alcohol could be harmful and uh, alcohol, you know, the, the negative effects of alcohol. However, we do have a drunkenness issue. There is alcoholism today. Were there unique alcoholism problems to the early 20th century that they were addressing? Or was it more that it was just unaddressed and they were trying to create some sort of a movement to stop it? Yeah, I mean, certainly unaddressed. But also, if you if you take like, you know, alcoholism or drinking too much with a man who has superior strength to a woman who also has rights to take her body whenever he wants, you know, within marriage, you, you know, get into a lot of trouble, right? So if a woman can't resist her husband, isn't doesn't have sort of legal authority to resist her husband, and he's drunk, you know, and she has, <laughs> I mean, she believes very strongly, as all the women's rights advocates did, as women just did, that she owes duties of care to the child she's nurturing within her body, then it becomes like this situation where 
she is now having, you know, numbers of children that she's having a hard time supporting because, um, you know, as as these women would say, that, that basically out of the lust of her husband when he was drunk would take his wife and then she'd there be pregnant again. And so there wasn't like this sort of, you know, understanding, especially if women weren't understood to kind of have equal dignity and and that a marriage of friendship, the way so many of us would understand our marriages today, right? It's a it's if there's a if there's an understanding of subordination that comes out of especially, I think, very false understandings of scripture, where, you know, men just sort of are able to lord it over their husbands rather than uh, sorry, over their wives rather than sort of love them with affection, that becomes very, very dangerous. And I think that that's what they were fighting against. So there's a Christian teaching, of course, that we are to, uh, you know, in a sense, there is a possession of each other's bodies as spouses and that we are to be available to our spouse sexually. I mean, that that's a, a Christian teaching. Explain that, though, in this context, because if there's a demand for sex from one spouse and especially if there's drunkenness involved and then the other spouse, there is a important health condition or concern about being able to care for the children or something how does Christian theology uh, impact that? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, chastity is at the core. It's a, it's considered a virtue that's been, um, it, that's very important. Uh, why? <laughs> because of the fact that sexual activity can, um, you know, result in a child, and that child needs a mom and dad to take care of it, right? And so, I think it's the generosity that spouses ought to all, always show to their you know, to the other spouse as much as they can, right? But then always recognizing that in that act, a new child could be born. And so there has to be a sort of responsibility around it. Are we ready to undertake this responsibility as parents, you know? And so I think that that, the the chastity, what we can also understand as sexual integrity is really important for the health of the marriage, right? It's not, I feel sexual desire right now. Therefore, you know, regardless of what, you know, sort of principle or reason tells me about our certain our circumstances right now, you know, you owe it to me to have sex with you. And that's just not an, a, a proper understanding of chastity within marriage today. What's also interesting here is the whole role of law is to basically hold back the the negative excesses of human behavior. You know, we uh, since the fall, we sin, we make mistakes, we're wounded by original sin. And so rule of law is to curb bad behavior. <laughs> That's the whole point. And the idea of, you know, these women trying to have laws in place that ultimately curb bad behavior in marriage and in the family unit in order to protect the most vulnerable members of that unit, it seems to be common sense. But if it's taken out of that context and thinking in terms of curbing bad behavior and instead shown as a threat somehow to marriage, because I think today there are some maybe conservatives or anti-feminists who say, well, the whole feminism work was just to divide marriages, to, to, to create a wedge between men and women. And your argument seems to be different from that, though. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, I think, you know, law also, in my understanding of the law, is that it's, it's educative and formative, right? And so it helps us to understand what the good is. And so to sort of aim for the good, not as our parents do, but as sort of in terms of like what the common good as a whole is. So, I mean, here's, I, I think it's helpful to sort of put some quotes on here that are helpful. So at Seneca Falls, there's an understanding, you know, a call upon men to sort of come to a higher level of kind of sexual integrity. And, and for those listening really quick, Erica, explain it, just yeah. give us the quick context on Seneca Falls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sorry. So, Seneca Falls is the first women's rights convention in 1848, um, brought together by Lucretia Mott, who we don't hear about a lot, but I really want to talk about her, as well as um, as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who met uh, in 1840 at a, um, uh, uh, an abolitionist um, uh, convention in London, which they were kept out of because they were women. A lot of Seneca Falls, and you can, you know, when you start reading it, you see it is because women, these women were abolitionists. They were very strongly against slavery. And they were told by conservatives of the day that they that to speak out publicly against slavery, especially in mixed audiences of men and women, was to be unwomanly. And so, you know, you have, um, uh, let me give you some, some language. So the general, so, so this is in 1837. So this is after the Grimke sisters um, Sarah Grimke, a very important uh, figure in the early women's rights advocates who wrote um, a uh, sort of treatise on the letter uh, called The Letters on the Equality of the Sexes, which we can get into. She actually, just parenthetically, she exegetes the Bible, so Genesis, 
And she does actually what John Paul II would do, you know, hundreds of years later, in that she basically says that, you know, men and women were created equal by God and that the fall is telling us, sort of giving a description of what, you know, the temptations of man would ha- that a man, a husband would have to lord it out over his wife and a woman would have to kind of be um, uh, subservient in a way that wasn't sort of putting God first. Um, anyway, so that's Sarah Grimke, a uh, really impressive writer. But so anyway, so in 1837, you have the, the General Association of Congregationalist Ministers who are responding to the Grimke sisters who are fighting, you know, very vocally for abolition against slavery. And what they're told is that, you know, the appropriate duties and influence of women are clearly stated in the New Testament. The power of woman is in her dependence, flowing from the consciousness of that weakness which God has given you for the, her protection and which keeps her in those departments of life that form the character of individuals and of the nation. When she assumes the place and tone of man as a public reformer, our care and protection of her seems unnecessary. We put ourselves in self-defense against her. She yields the power which God has given her for protection and her character becomes unnatural. So it'd be like, Lila, if someone said to you, you are becoming manly or unnaturally, you know, masculine by speaking out against abortion in a public setting. And so these women were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and there are, you by know, the way, a couple, there there, there are a couple uh, strange voices on the right, unfortunately, who do say things close to that. So oh, you know, those wow, voices probably have, I, I mean, I think those voices, the, the extreme on this, I think has always existed and at yeah. different times has been more popularized than others. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And so you have like, especially someone like Lucretia Mott, who is, you know, a Quaker, very serious Bible-believing Christian, who's going also, like Grimke did, to scripture and arguing from the basis of sort of equal dignity in the Imago Dei, that women have a responsibility to, you know, speak out against these things. And that it's not going to make them, you know, um, you know, manly or something like that. She So there's, um, let me read from her discourse on woman. And I just think this is helpful because, again, there's a way in which we sort of have this quick, um, we don't sort of read the text, you know, we just sort of assume like we package everybody together and assume they all thought the same thing. But it's really important to see how very kind of nuanced they were in in their um, in their reflection. So here's Lu- Lu- Lucretia Mott, again, Bible-believing Quaker who is a co-author of Seneca Falls. She says, we would admit all the difference, that is the difference between the sexes, that our great and beneficent creator has made in the relation of man and woman. Nor would we seek to disturb this relation, but we deny that the present possess- position of woman is her true sphere of usefulness. Nor will she attain to this sphere until the disabilities and disadvantages, religious, civil, and social, which impede her progress, are removed out of the way. These restrictions have enervated her mind and paralyzed her powers. And so, you know, she she then goes on to say, "Let, let her cultivate all the graces and proper accomplishments of her sex, but let them not degenerate into a kind of effeminacy in which she is satisfied to be the mere plaything or toy of society, content with her outward adornings and with a tone of flattery, so, I mean, they're really, they, you know, they want women to stand up and be responsible for themselves, for their children, for the good of society, and not sort of be just concerned about their appearances or, you know, making a good marriage mate by kind of acting, you know, dumb. They want them to, like, you know, be wise and strong in mind and character. And I, and I think that that's just greatly admirable of these women. There is such a prevailing narrative, again, among some, I will say, conservatives, and then certainly in the the red pill and the, I mean, I'm going to say aspects of the rad trad world. I tread carefully here because these labels can mean different things and there's different people that populate them, you know, these groups. So I'll say some folks in these groups, okay? But there's yeah. a prevailing narrative among some, um, and you'll definitely find it on Twitter if you uh, get into the sort of uh, these spaces that basically says women having the right to vote, women having the right to property, women having the right to divorce, women having the right to custody of their kids, all of these things, right? Uh, the right to work um, and, you know, have contracts, things like that, independent of a, a male in their life, a patriarch in their life or a husband. They ultimately misuse those powers. And that's why we have the cultural chaos of today. We have abortion. Now with gender ideology, we have the insanity there. 
We have, you know, the the sexual revolution that happened in the you know mid 20th century. And those things wouldn't have happened, certainly not to the level they've escalated without women having this newfound political power and social standing in the late and uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. I think that's a very even among some very well-intentioned folks, it's just a very strong narrative that makes them see feminism bad. What's yep. your response to that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's accompanying that? I mean, my entire book, The Rights of Women, is is devoted to sort of showing that there's these two competing strains of both, you know, claims for er women's rights uh, early on, which, you know, is anachronistic to kind of call them feminists, but we do just shorthand call them early feminists that come straight up. And so one is this strain, kind of the one that I've been mostly focusing on here, right? It's a strain that really views men and women as deeply interdependent, that sees, you know, care in the in the family as really important and the work of kind of the family as um as sort of, you know, the key institution um, that undergirds all other institutions. Uh, they see that work as collaborative. Um, and they're just, you know, working to sort of negotiate um, the relationship between men and women and how sort of the law should shift as circumstances shift. What's the circumstance? Well, industrialization is the most obvious, right? And and that strain I view as, as coming straight out of Mary Wollstonecraft, who many of these early women's rights advocates like Sarah Grimke and Lucretia Mott, who I've just mentioned as being deeply Christian thinkers, that they're coming out of that strain. And so we can certainly talk about Wollstonecraft in a second. The other strain is coming out of, I read as John Stuart Mill, who, you know, has an idea of liberty as sort of um, individuality, as pursuit of individuality. And that strain goes straight to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who actually calls herself, I mean, she she sees Mill, John Stuart Mill and Harriet Ta you know, Taylor, who was his mistress, um, as being sort of the, the people she looks to for her thought. And you see that strain going right up to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And so who wins? Well, the regnant philosophy, the regnant um, feminism is that latter strain. It's the Stanton, the million Stanton Ruth Bader Ginsburg philosophy. And it's incredibly libertarian. So it views rights and freedom as kind of its own end. And so it's really for the sake of individuality. It's for the sake of autonomy. And it has the trouble with that strain, and that's why we're bumping into all sorts of problems right now, is that it's an ill-founded strain. It's not based on who we actually are as human beings. And it and it kind of has, it, it takes the individual freedom and the individual itself as being sort of the male individual who can sort of escape, you know, from, from the consequences of sex. And so that's where you get abortion is you see like, okay, we're going to have, you know, equality in the mark in the, you know in the in the market and it's going to have to look like what men look like which is unencumbered you know um free to walk away from sexual activity and all that and so we'll need abortion contraception and abortion to get there and so that's the strain that i follow from again sanger straight into uh, sorry stanton straight into sanger and then all the way up um to ginsburg so this other strain this wollstonecraftian state understands liberty and rights and equality entirely differently and so what i'm trying to do in the book is show that there's this lost vision that we kind of took a wrong turn in in understanding human beings, understanding men and women improperly. And what Wollstonecraft understood, what Lucretia Mott, Grimke all understood, that the purpose of freedom, the purpose of liberty is for carrying out our duties virtuously. And so what you see in their, all of, you know, their thinking is a lot of talk of responsibility, a lot of talk of virtue, and 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 that freedom is for this end. It's for the good of of, you know, the happiness of of the whole. And that's and that's a strain that was lost, but one that I think really has the capacity to come, um, you know, to be kind of reclaimed. And that's what I'm trying to do. The one thing I'll say before we get to that strain that I really want to talk a lot about mm -hmm. is that both these strains until you get to even including Margaret Sanger, but she's kind of questionable. They were all against abortion. And so for your work, it's really important <laughs> that even the ones that I think are, you know, we could talk about that are that are really headed in the wrong direction pretty early on, like an Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who really, you know, has, you know, a, a kind of a whole, you know, um, this, you know, solitude of self is her big essay where she talks about, you know, everybody is ultimately just alone by themselves, you know, like Robin Crusoe on an, on an island responsible for themselves. I mean, that's kind of her thing. She's all of them are against abortion and they all understand that they have duties of care to children. They understand them as children. 
when they are developing in the in their mother's womb. And so even people like the the craziest ones, like Victoria Woodhull, who's the most radical of the group, you know, free love advocate, um, uh, you know, all sorts of other things. She actually had the most the most forceful language language when it comes to abortion. And so let me can if I can just just give you what she says about abortion because I think it's fascinating that of the the most radical of these women in the 19th century were still against abortion. She she says it is just as much a murder to destroy life in its embryonic condition as it is to destroy it after the fully developed form is it attain is attained for it is the self same life that is taken. And so I mean that's like the best pro life argument there is, right? <laughs> So they got this early on. They were also accompanied by all the earliest women doctors. There's a really great book um, coming out, and I hope you'll have Monica on, Monica Clem, coming out of Encounter Books. It's called Pity for Evil, and it's about these women's rights advocates and female doctors in the 19th century who are all on board with um, you know, seeing abortion as this reprehensible crime and evil that it, that they understood it to be. And so, again, so even as you have this kind of these different strains of women's rights and understandings of the ground of women's rights in the 19th century, you still have them all kind of appalled by by, you know, abortion and um, and just the evil of of a mother taking the life of her own child. Every Life is a diaper company that makes well-crafted products for your baby, wipes and diapers, and it's a pro-life company. So every time you buy Every Life diaper products, which are as good quality as Honest Company or any other company, you are directly supporting the pro-life movement because they donate part of their money back to the pro-life movement. So go check out everylife.com, order your first diapers and wipes, give them as a gift, get them for your baby, get them for your niece or your grandbaby. It's a wonderful product and it supports your values. Go to everylife.com and use the code LILA10 for 10% off your order. I mean, labels are so powerful. So just, you know, just put the feminist label on both of these strains that you just explained so well, Erica, you know, the strain of, okay, we want uh, equal treatment under the law, and we have equal dignity to men, but we're different, and those differences are good. And we, in addition to our rights, have responsibilities to each other and right. to children. We're seeking virtue as a shared project. The family is the most important institution. You know, all this beautiful truth, right? And wanting those same rights that this other group is asking for, you know, the right to vote, the right to uh, custody of children, the right to uh, be able to work and, and you know, ha- ha- possess property, But this other group saying, well, I want these things because it is about the individual's power to create themselves and seek their own destiny and tethered by other relationships or responsibilities and how different those two groups end up. With one group, you end up with this beautiful Christian collaborative family who is, you know, changing the world and building this, you know, growing these beautiful kids. And in another group, you get these, you know, free love sexual revolutionaries who are off destroying society, right? That's but right. the problem is they're both called in their you know, first wave. <laughs> they're both called right. feminists. Yeah. <laughs> so what yeah, do we yeah, do yeah. with this problem, Erica? Because, you know, I, yeah. we, I interviewed Carrie Grass on the podcast and, you know, in, in her interpretation, she has the group of, of feminists. And basically, the, it's hard to redeem feminism, you know, to her point, because of all of the baggage. And so it's hard to even, you know, pull out these 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 noble threads and these good threads that you're uh, writing so you know, beautifully on in your book. What is the solution for how we even talk about this today? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I would do, sorry to go back to the history just briefly, because I do want to get to kind of the tactical question of do we even use this word feminist? Because I do think it's a tactical question for sure. But I just want to say, because this idea of free love is important, because one of the one of the premises of my book that's really important is that you know, this idea that we have today that the sexual revolution and feminism are one or the sexual revolution and women's rights, the cause of women's rights are like knit together. And so you see that the left certainly assumes that and the right, you know, some on the right start sort of the further right assume that too. And I think it's really crucial to see that nothing could be farther from the truth in the sense that those, again, Many of the early women's rights advocates were arguing for chastity. I mean, votes for women, chastity for men was like one of their basic slogans. But we should get into some of that more. What I do want to do is just quote again Sarah Grimke because she is dealing with exactly this claim. So it's 1855. So it's several years after, 
you know, Seneca Falls, where they've written this declaration of sentiments and resolutions. They've called upon um, men to have the same virtue, delicacy, and refinement of behavior that's required of women should be required of men. And then, you know, she's basically accused or they're accused in the New York Times of uh, that that this idea of equality of rights, and I'm quoting here, leads directly and rapidly to the principles of free love. Because there are people at this stage. So, I mean, I guess Stanton, one of them, Victoria Woodhull, certainly a lot of men <laughs> who are arguing that, you know, really you should kind of be able to enter into and out of relationships mainly because they have problems with marriage, with institution of marriage, because they see it as confining, but also because of all the problems that we've talked about with regard to women, right? So, I mean, free love, it's not like the 1970s version because you don't have the pill at abortion mediating, you know, your capacity to be as promiscuous as you want outside of marriage or whatever. So this is like a very kind of confined version of free love, but it's still, it's still a, you know, anti-marriage principle. And so what she, what she says is the conclusion that this, you know, this 1855 New York Times article draws that equality of rights leads directly and rapidly to the principles of free love or that a claim for women's rights nullified the very idea of marriage is anything about more than a partnership of the will. She says, I utterly deny. She goes on to give this really incredible kind of speech about lust and chastity within marriage. Uh, it's, a, it's an article, not a speech. But then she says the doctrine that human beings are to follow their attractions, which lies at the base of that miscalled free love system, is fraught with infinite danger. Our great desire is to purify and exalt the marriage relation and destroy all licentiousness. To every unhappy couple, we say, bear in quiet home seclusion the heart-withering consequences of your mistake. She's basically saying, you need to stay together even if you're unhappy. Just don't, you know, divorce willy-nilly. She says, you owe this to yourselves, to your children, to society. And then she talks about keeping pure from the desecration of marriage. Um, basically, lust, that it should be, she says, um, you need love and chastity. If you cannot live this purely together and separation becomes necessary, let no temporary or permanent relation be formed by either party during the life of the other. She says, in marriage is the origin of life. In the union of the sexes exists a creative energy which is found nowhere else. And so she's really arguing very much strongly opposed to the to the idea of free love. So though there were free love advocates at that time, these early women's rights advocates in the main were not them. Those ones that did go off the path, like Stanton and then Woodhull, they get kicked out of the women's rights movement. <laughs> you know, they're especially when Stanton writes her woman's Bible. I mean, think about it. You've got Lucretia Mott and Seneca Falls, the two kind of brains Sorry, mm -hmm. Lucretia Mott and um, and Sarah Grimke, real it's kind of the brains of of the early movement, and they're exegeting um, scripture in the way again that John Paul II would do much much later, and so they're looking for at scripture to see the imago dei and to see the responsibilities that men and women have together, and then you have you know you know Stanton come along and say no, we need to rewrite the Bible. So she's basically accepting the claim that the conservatives are making that the Bible is subordinating women, is saying the women are inferior. And they're saying no, in the Bible is our, you know, our freedom to be beholden to God and to have responsibilities and live, you know, for virtue. So, I mean, they're very upset with her. So I guess I would just say that it's not a, it's not a, it's a complicated history, but that there's all these beautiful strains that run right through the center of, of the early uh, women's rights movement. All right. So I, I, we'll get to tactical in a minute because we do need to talk about yeah. Wollstonecraft um, because she was very in your work and your writing and your research. She's very important. And we, we talked about her on the podcast recently in terms of she was more in line of, you know, a, a precursor of what would become the free love movement. But you have a different interpretation of Wollstonecraft. What's your why is Mary Wollstonecraft important to understanding the women's rights movement and feminism later on? And what was her position? Yeah, it's um, really just completely against her thought to see her as a precursor to free love. So, I mean, I'll give you many quotes, but um, just sort of some salient ones. We've actually, at the Abigail Adams Institute, we now have a link that I hope you'll include in the show notes, which is basically read Wollstonecraft. So you can go and read some of her thought and see it for yourself, that it's really beautiful and ennobling. But one, one thing she says is, chastity, modesty, public spirit, and all the tr noble train of virtues on which social virtue and happiness are built should be understood and cultivated by all mankind 
or they will be cultivated to little effect. And so she's really pushing for men to be as responsible for chastity and purity as much as sort of women are expected to be. But I, I also want to kind of get back before chastity, and we can talk about why, you know, Stanton and others, especially 1970s feminists, sort of see her, her as this free love, you know, this represent, representative of free love. But I think it's really important to kind of get to her thought first. So she, as I mentioned before, she's sort of, in her vindication of the rights of women, she's really, she's showing that the need for women to be educated and to have rights are necessary so that they can be strong and serious and good wives and mothers and citizens and friends. And so freedom is not kind of an end in itself to like willy nilly do whatever you want, but it's for the end of virtue. So she talks about that women and men should both rise in excellence, I'm quoting now, by the exercise of powers implanted for that purpose to be excellent. One of the I'll give you a couple beautiful quotes from some of her early work. She says in her thoughts on the education of daughters. So before she kind of enters into the political sort of arena with some um, some of her arguments, she is a pedagogue. So she uh, starts a school for girls. And her very first book is Thoughts on the Education of Daughters. And she says in that book the many wonderful things. But she says, the main business of our lives is to learn to be virtuous. And he, capital H, he, God, who is training us, for immortal bliss knows what best trials will contribute to make us so. She then says in Original Stories for Real Life, which is a really beautiful book where she's um, telling the story of these two children who have this governess who's teaching them kind of how to live a virtuous life. And one of the things the governess says, uh, she says, um, we are all dependent on each other. And this dependence is wisely ordered by our Heavenly Father to call forth many virtues to exercise the best affections of the human heart and fix them into habits. She says, the wiser and better you grow, the more visible will God become. For wisdom consists in searching him out and goodness in endeavoring to copy his attributes. So f the final thing I'll say is there's kind of, there's been, you know, for a long time, I mean, Wollstonecraft is like one of the most misunderstood women in history. <laughs> and we'll get to that. But one of the things she says that's really important is that she says that, you know, women and men, I mean, she's talking, she talks an awful lot about mothers and fathers and how important, and she really is kind of ennobling the work of motherhood and fatherhood. And you can probably guess why without reading too much is because the work of inculcating virtue in children, she sees to be really the highest work of a civilization because of how important virtue is for human happiness, for societal happiness. But she does see that, of course, mothers and fathers are very different. And so she, one of her lines is, um, women, I allow, have different duties to fulfill, but they are human duties. And the principles which d should regulate the discharge of them, I sturdily maintain, must be the same. So she's saying because God is one and we are to imitate God's goodness, that women and men are both called to the whole panoply of human virtues. It sh it's not just that men are to be courageous and women to be are, are to be pure and chaste. But men are to be pure and chaste and women are to be courageous. And those virtues are going to look totally different in men and women because of, you know, men and women have different bodies. But um, but they are both called to all of that and not just sort of confined into this, you know, small set. Um, and, and, and so, you know, being courageous can be very womanly as those, you know, those women who are fighting against slavery um, well could, you know, well saw. Well, and Christ says, be perfect as I am perfect. And we're that's a command for men and for women. And to live out the virtues in seeking God and love, you know, for the sake of love of God and love of others, you live them out as a woman, you live them out as a man, and you become more masculine and more feminine, but they are the same virtues. And I think that's, you know, it's that's a right. mystery, but it's a it's a beautiful one. There is a strain, and I, I want to go to the tactical, uh, you know, the solutions for how we deal with all yep. this stuff today. There's one more strain. Well, there's two more things I want to ask you about. There's there's a strain today, even among some, I would say, Christians. Uh, I think it's a theological mistake that they're making. And this is infecting some parts of, you know, I would say maybe far right Catholics and then certainly, um, you know, maybe some um, Protestants or evangelicals, non-denominationals, um, some conservatives. 
But anyways, it's this idea that men and women have different natures and women, you know, by nature are more prone to certain vices and men are more prone to certain vices. And therefore, they should be uh, treated differently, even under law, potentially. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think that's a it's a great question. And it's a uh, I'm going to try to give an answer that um, I think is it's a sophisticated um, question with a sophisticated answer. And that is that I actually agree that men and women are prone to different vices because our vices sort of come out of our lower appetites generally. And so if you think about the differences between men and women um, are kind of mediated not only by the fact that, as Aristotle said, women reproduce inside themselves and men reproduce outside of themselves, right? Like women's <laughs> bodies enable them to carry children and men's don't. But it's also the hormones that allow that, right? So a woman's body is organized around the capacity of children. And so she has estrogen, lots of estrogen in her body. And a man has lots of testosterone in his body as they grow through puberty, right? And so because of testosterone, I mean, what we're what we understand now, which a lot of people had insights to before, I mean, you know, even Wollstonecraft talks about men as more libidinous, more kind of um, has kind of greater sexual urges, and that's due to testosterone. And so men are, have greater risk taking, greater kind of um, sexual desire, desire to have it fulfilled, not necessarily within commitment. And so they need really self mastery to master those appetites to become the gentlemen who will, you know, be great fathers, engage fathers, and 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 people for others. And I think in the same, and so if you can imagine, a vicious man tends to have you know, highly stereotypical masculine attributes, right? So violence, aggression, you know, rape, all those things. The more vicious he gets, the more sort of steeped in like, I don't know, like a, a, te a testosterone that hasn't been, you know, governed by reason and principle and virtue, right? And I think you could say the same is true for women. And this is actually something that Wollstonecraft is also battling against, and that, you know, we just heard from Lucretia Maud is there's a way in which women can become so effeminate that they kind of consider themselves as like playthings, that they're just there for dress, you know, to look pretty, to just be sort of um, like, you know, objectified. They can objectify only fans. themselves. <laughs> oh, yeah. Only, only, only fans. fans. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, right. And so, and also, I mean, think of the way in which this help happens. Like women have a greater capacity for empathy because of all this estrogen and this like attachment, the connection, the oxy, you know, um, the oxytocin that, that, you know, is released during pregnancy and, and, um, and, uh, breastfeeding and all of that. So that, that attachment can also make them, I think, less like less sort of adhere to the truth sometimes where their empathy overtakes what is true. And so, what does that mean? So they think every disagreement is like an HR problem. <laughs> you know, they think, um, uh, you know, they think like in order to be kind to someone who has gender dysphoria and really empathize with them, they should think it's fine for them to, you know, have gender reassignment surgery, that kind of thing. You know, so there's like a so those kind of capacities, I think, are distinctive. And so that's why I actually believe that single sex education is really good for boys and girls because of neat when they grow and 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 master themselves and become virtuous they need to have those they need to be have sort of emotional regulation and physical regulation you know respectively for boys and girls however all that said i think as a man and woman become virtuous that you don't really know whether they're going to look, you know, they're going to look, a woman's going to look feminine and have feminine virtue because she's a fem, she's female. So, right. But you don't know exactly what that's going to look like. Is she going to be, you know, incredibly um, docile and quiet or is she going to be like Joan of Arc? You know, it just kind of depends on what God calls her to and what her gifts are and what her capacities are. And same with a man. Is he going to look like, you know, strong, like St. Ignatius, or is he going to be St. Francis? You know, all of these, the whole panoply of virtue or the whole kind of panoply of saints, I think, within the church shows that, um, that you know, grace and virtue is not kind of um, a cookie cutter thing with regard to the sexes. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. And so, you know, when when a woman is trying to figure out how to be herself and how to be deeply feminine, I think being docile to the Holy Spirit is much more important to, than being docile to some set of like stereotypical gender norms. At least that's mm -hmm. what I found in my life and I found to be true in 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 the great women um, that I know. So like yourself, by the way, Lila. <laughs> so, thank you. And so is it correct to say, you know, we share human nature 
which That's right. is a much bigger common denominator than anything else. That's but right. is it fair to say there's additional impact on our nature and they call they can, you know, it's called female, the female nature or the male nature that provides, you know, maybe different challenges and strengths for men versus women. Yeah. So I stay away from sort of male and female nature just because I think it's as as Wollstonecraft would say, it's unphilosophical <laughs> in the sense that we do have one human nature. I mean, if you're going to talk about it in sort of colloquial terms, sure. But the problem with that is that I think it gets us too close to Rousseau. And Rousseau is very much like Wollstonecraft's interlocutor. And he really did see women and men as having like entirely different natures that require different education entirely because women were made for men's delight. And so there were only some subset of virtues that were for women they were they were sort of meant to be docile and to sort of through their chastity and purity tame men's virile nature and i just don't think that's right at all i think both men and women are called to self mastery on their own you know it's like men are responsible to tame themselves <laughs> you know through their own um you know work of of self mastery of virtue acquisition, of corresponding with grace, and same with women. And I think obviously we can help each other as brothers and sisters by, you know, women not dressing immodestly and things like that. Sure. But I think it's a man's responsibility to govern his own appetites. It's a woman's responsibility to govern her own appetites because you can't be virtuous for another. And I think I think Rousseau was incredibly faulty in that regard. And that's where Wollstonecraft is trying to correct him and say, no, both men and women are rational creatures made by and responsible to God, and both have to, on their own, live out all of the virtues. And they're responsible to do that in order to become great fathers, mothers, friends, citizens. It's interesting that you can trace, you know, someone like, you know, the social media influencer, Andrew Tate, who says that, you know, men can be yeah. promiscuous, women must be cha chased. You know, the woman wants to go to the spa and that's great, buy her handbags, but the man is concerned with, you know, making money and protecting the family. And like, he, you know, he has that sort of extreme male, female nature uh, thing going yeah. on in his worldview. And it's directly, uh, you know, w w per what you just said, it's directly can be traced back to Rousseau. I don't know that he knows Definitely. that, you know, he probably doesn't yeah. know that. But uh, it's interesting to see how these things popping up today are not new theories, are not new that's ideologies. Right. You can trace them back. And that's why the history is so important. I so appreciate the historical work you've done in combing through and understanding these really thought leaders over the last few centuries and their impact on today. All right, so let's end with the practical stuff because uh, you know that's where I live most of my time. And yeah. I know that the, the folks listening are really interested in that because it's like, okay, all of this may be true. And ultimately, you know, I believe it's the Christian vision of the man and the woman and what it means to be a family and morality and virtue that is the answer, right? But then we have to live in this complicated thing called politics and how do we operate in politics and and culture with these truths and these principles that we have. So, you know, feminism, do you call yourself a feminist? Should we call ourselves, uh, you know, Christians who are feminists or do we completely leave that label? Uh, do we toss it because it has so much baggage and it has that other as you called it, I think a thread of, um, you know, kind of free love and radical individualism, libertarianism in it. Mm -hmm. What do we do with what we call ourselves and show as we show up politically to make yeah. important decisions about where how we should live together in society? Yeah. So, I mean, I think everybody has to kind of figure this out for themselves. You know, if you no, um, want to leave. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, I'm going to make a pitch for feminism, but I just think okay. like I am not... You know, uh, I don't know that I, you know, if someone doesn't want to call themselves a pro-life feminist, I'm going to be, you know, appalled by that or something. I do think, though, in our time that retaining the term feminism is really important. Why? Because of the assault on, well, first of all, because liberal feminism has fallen apart. So, like, the, uh, the possible emergence of this lost vision that I, you know, articulate in my book is very much coming. <laughs> I mean, I see it rising. I see it rising at... Fair Disputations, which is an online journal um, that I helped to found where people like Mary Harrington, Louise Perry, Nina Power, Angela Franks, Abby Favalli, Leela Bresco, where we're all writing, right? And so we all call ourselves feminists. Why is it? Because I think the way I would say it is because of sexually and reproductive asymmetry. There's a way in which all feminisms are responding to that in some way. And I think the technological sort of, you know, 
the response that was the pill and abortion um, and kind of individuality is really kind of come to its end. And it's really, we've seen it come to its end in the trans movement, I think very much so. So it's kind of bankrupt. And so out, you know, something, a new feminism can emerge, just like John Paul II called for new feminism many decades ago. And why do you need feminism? Because of this asymmetry, because you need, women have distinctive needs and interests. And because many, many, many of us are mothers and don't have time to like, you know, be out there picketing and involved in politics, often like maternity and maternal and sort of um, the needs that women have that are distinctive are not paid as much attention to. And so I think that's why you need something like that. I mean, we certainly need it now with porn, with prostitution, with surrogacy, with sex trafficking, with the trans movement of, you know, men trying to say that they're women, all of that to me, those are distinctively, those are, those are questions where all sorts of feminists, regardless if we disagree on different kinds of questions, can come together to fight against those things that are erasing women, that are, um, that are, you know, abusing women, that are, you know, basically thinking that we're obsolete and our, and, you know, our bodies can be used by rich men. You know, so I think there's all sorts of ways in which we are needing to respond once more to the kind of, to elevate the dignity of women um, and and to say that it's, you know, that we as having feminine bodies that have, again, are organized around, you know, bearing children, even if we never do, that there are particular just responses to that, that um, I think all sorts of feminists can be talking about. And so f- to my mind, it's like, I'm all in the business of trying to convince other feminists that abortion is one of those questions. And I think I've had some success there, so I'm going to keep at it. (laughs) Well, thank you for trying. And I I think there is success. You know, I see uh, pro-life feminists left and right, and I think there's many more of them today than there were even a decade or two ago. And they're not feminists in the sense of, you know, man-hating, women are superior, you know, free love. Not at all. They're feminists in terms of, Let's take responsibility for the beautiful capacity that we have to be mothers and we need to be collaborative with men. And in order to protect those things, we need to share civil rights and we need to uh, protect the right. civil rights for ourselves yeah. and for our children. You know, part of those is that first. Yeah, I mean, if you have human right, like, which is life. Yeah, I mean, if you have the rise of an anti-feminism that is claiming that women don't need rights right now and just get married and, you know, obey your husband and all will be fine like that it seems to me that you have to have a new feminism to articulate a new and on better grounds on grounds that are consistent with who we are as human beings as men and women that we how do you you know negotiate living together in this highly technological world now too you know where we are you know um uh it's it's it feels like our embodiedness is sort of drifting away and and more easily attacked because people are online all the time and all that so there's so much to be said um, and I would really commend kind of all the work of of the women I mentioned and the work of Fair Disputations. I would also, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but in order, if you want to go and read Wollstonecraft yourself, we're putting um, more stuff online at the Wollstonecraft Project at the Abigail Adams Institute. And I would just say, I think she's a complicated figure to be sure. She, um, you know, had uh, uh, parts of her life that were very, very difficult for her. And, um, and, and you know, she fell into some despair um, but I think that there's her work itself and her thought has really been recovered in the last couple of decades um, by all sorts of different um, academics and theologians and political theorists and all that. And it's really I would just really commend actually reading her work um, to to your listeners. Well, and Erica, how can people find and follow your work and also purchase your latest book? Yes. So I am a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and they kindly put all of my work up on their site. So you can find me there. And then, of course, you can uh, find the book at Amazon and Notre Dame Press and anywhere else, I guess, you find your book. Give us give us the name again. The Rights of Women Reclaiming a Lost Vision. Wonderful. Erica, thank you. Thank you for giving us such an incredible walk through understanding the history here and I think giving us a very positive vision for the work we have at hand. Thank you, Lila, so much for having me on. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast if you're not already subscribed. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're not already subscribed. Leave us a review on Apple. This helps the podcast to reach more people. Give us five stars. 
And of course, join the Patreon community. If you're not already a patron, and big shout out to our patrons. We're getting more. I really appreciate the growing Patreon community. Please become a patron of the podcast. When you become a patron of the podcast, I can start planning more for the future of the show about how we're going to bring on more teams, create more episodes. I want to produce other podcasts in the future. All this is going to help us grow this content and reach more people with it. So check out the Patreon at the link in the bio and become a patron of the podcast and you can join us for our monthly live stream for patrons. Thanks so much and you guys have a great rest of your day.